Hey guys, this topic is absolutely essential for chemistry. First part of AQA, atomic structure and the periodic table. If you want to get a checklist, make sure you've covered absolutely everything. You can get that over my website, my free version guide, or you can get that on Amazon. Here we have our wonderful, beautiful periodic table. It is a list of all the elements which are known to exist. Elements are a single type of atom. An atom is a very, very small thing. The word atom is actually Greek for uncuttable. And when they named them, they thought it was the smallest thing possible. The periodic table tells us loads and loads and loads of information about the elements, the range of elements that are known to exist. There are still loads yet to be discovered. A compound is two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. That's the important thing. Chemically bonded together. Here we have the structure of an atom. We have electrons that are on the shells around the outside, protons that are in the middle, and neutrons that are in the middle. And this bit in the middle here is collectively called the nucleus. Protons are in the nucleus. They have a mass of 1 and a charge of plus 1. Neutrons are also in the nucleus. They have a mass of 1 and a charge of 0. Electrons are in the outer shells. Their mass is 1 to thousandths and they have a charge of minus 1. On the periodic table, you will see lots of boxes like this. This tells you all about the elements. This is the element's name, the symbol, and there are two numbers. This is the atomic number, and this one is the mass number. Now for these, location doesn't matter. Different textbooks, different sheets are going to put them in different locations. The larger one is the mass number. And the smaller one is the atomic number. The atomic number tells us the number of protons. And the number of electrons in an atom. The mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So here we have calcium. The smaller number is the atomic number. The large number is the mass number. And if you want to find the number of protons, it is simply the atomic number, so in this case 20. The number of electrons is also the atomic number, so again 20. The neutrons is the mass number, which is 40, minus the atomic number, which is 20, equaling 20. You need to be able to take a set of words and turn it into a balanced symbol equation. So there is quite a lot for you to do here because you need to remember the chemical symbols for quite a large number of things. Water is H2O. That turns into hydrogen gas, which is going to be H2, plus oxygen gas, which is going to be O2. And now we need to balance it. Draw a line down the middle, circle everything, and list what we have. We have hydrogen, we have oxygen, we have hydrogen, we have oxygen. Count the number of things. Two hydrogens, one oxygen, two hydrogens, one ox two oxygens, sorry. So we need to increase the number of oxygens on this side because you see there aren't enough. Then we have to add another H2O, put that in a circle, redo our numbers. We now have two four hydrogens and two oxygens. So our oxygens are balanced but now our hydrogens, are, we have more on this side than we do on this side. So we need to add more hydrogens here. Again, the only thing we can do is to add a whole another bubble. We now have two hydrogens here, two hydrogens here, making four in total and two oxygens. So now we have four hydrogens on this side, two oxygens, four hydrogens and two oxygens. We need to rewrite that neatly for the examiner. So we have one, two bubbles, 
of H2O turning into one two bubbles of H2 plus one of O2. I seriously recommend you learn at least these formula. Carbon dioxide is CO2, water, H2O, oxygen gas, O2, hydrogen gas, H2, nitrogen gas, N2, ammonia, NH3, hydrochloric acid, HCl, sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Elements, pure things, compounds, two or more different things, chemically bonded together, mixture, lots of different things, some of them chemically bonded, some of them not. When you have mixtures and you want to separate them, there are a number of different things you can do. Distillation, where you're going to separate things off by boiling point, so things that have um, a different boiling point will distill at different temperatures. Evaporation, where we are going to remove the liquid and leave solids that have been dissolved in the liquid in the dish. Filtration, where we have large particles of solid in the liquid. The particles of solid will stay in the filter paper and the liquid will drip through. And fractional distillation, where you can take things off at different boiling points. We haven't always known that an atom had a nucleus and electrons orbiting around the outside. We used to have a plum pudding model where we had a large cloud of positive charge with negative electrons dotted throughout, a bit like a Christmas pudding, which is why it's called the plum pudding model. Rutherford and Marsden did an experiment to test the plum pudding model. They took an alpha particle gun, and alpha particles are positively charged, and they had a sheet of very thin gold foil. And what they did is they fired alpha particles at this sheet, and the majority of them went straight through which was a bit weird. Some of them got deflected a little bit and some of them got deflected a massive amount. And this suggested that there was a centre which was positive, a small part that was positive, and then a large section all around which was negative. And this led to the development by Bohr of the nuclear model that we use today. The model of the atom has changed quite a lot over time. You don't need to know all the details of this, you need to know that Rutherford was responsible for discovering the nucleus and protons. That Chadwick discovered neutrons. and that Bohr is our current, or developed our current model. The periodic table gives us loads and loads of information. The first bit of information it gives us are about groups. Now groups go down the periodic table. Group 1, group 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or group 0. Groups tell us the number of electrons on the outer shell. So things in group 1 are going to have one electron in the outer shell. Things in group 2 are going to have two electrons in the outer shell. Group 6, six electrons in the outer shell. Group 7, seven electrons in the outer shell. Periods go across the periodic table. So here is our first period, the one that everyone always forgets because it's only got hydrogen and helium in. Here is our second period. Here is our third period, and the periods relate to the number of shells that things have. They also remind us how many electrons there are on the, in each shell. So in the first period there are two elements, which means there are going to be two electrons in that shell. In the second period there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements, which means there are going to be eight electrons in that shell. And we can use this information to tell us about the electronic configuration. Here we have magnesium. Here is magnesium on the periodic table, and we can see that the number of electrons it has is 12. It is in group 2, and it is in period 3. So that tells us it has 12 electrons in total. It has 2 electrons on the outer shell, because it's in group number 2. And it has 3 shells, because it is in period number 3. So when we want to draw the electronic configuration of magnesium, we know it's in period 3, it's going to have 3 shells. The first thing we can do is draw 3 shells. Two 
one, two, go on the first um, shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, go on the second shell. That's the most that can fit in that shell. That brings us up to ten. Ten, eleven, twelve, two electrons on the outer shell. From the periods, we know that the first shell can hold a maximum of two electrons. The second shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons. The third shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons. And then you only need to know up to calcium, so another two for your GCSE. Here we have sodium, and it has an atomic number of 11, which means it's going to have 11 protons in the nucleus. And new protons have a positive charge. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11. Now in the atom it has 11 electrons drawn on here. Electrons have a negative charge. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Now in an atom the positive charges and the negative charges cancel each other out. So the overall charge on the atom is going to be 0. However when sodium makes an iron this electron here goes away. So it still has the same number of protons, it's still sodium. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But it's lost an electron. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it has one more proton than it has an electron. Meaning this is going to have an overall positive charge. Metals are going to lose electrons, and when we lose electrons, we get positive charges. And non-metals are going to be gaining electrons, and when we gain electrons, we get negative charges. Things in group 1 are going to lose 1 electron, so are going to be plus 1 ions. Things in group 2 are going to lose 2 electrons, so are going to be plus 2 ions. Things in group 6 here are going to gain two electrons, so are going to be minus two ions, and things in group seven are going to gain one electron, so are going to be minus one ions. This beautifully coloured periodic table is because there are lots of different groups, lots of different categories on the periodic table. Group number one are also known as alkali metals. Group number two are the alkali earth metals or alkaline metals. Group seven are the halogens. And group 8 are the noble gases. The big chunk in the middle are the transition metals. Our periodic table hasn't always looked like this. The first attempt at a periodic table was by Newlands in the 1800s. He tried to group things into octaves and break them by pattern, which is a really good idea, except we have oxygen and iron in the same group, and they have very different properties. He grouped them, he arranged them by mass, but he didn't leave any gaps. And he tried to force things in to have similar patterns or properties as other things, and it didn't really work. Mendeleev was the next person to have a go. He also arranged things by mass, but the key thing is that he left gaps in his periodic table. And because he arranged things um, so that they were in groups with similar patterns, and he left gaps, he could predict the properties of elements that have yet to be discovered, and he was correct in his predictions. A few years after he developed his periodic table, a couple of new elements were discovered, and they fitted in really, really neatly, really nicely to his periodic table. So this table was accepted. It has changed ever so slightly by then. We now arrange things by electronic arrangement, but that's a very, very subtle difference. The group right on the far right-hand side are group 8 or group 0. These are the noble gases. They have a full outer shell. And because they have a full outer shell, they don't want to gain or lose any electrons, which means they are really, really unreactive. And because they are unreactive, they actually have quite a lot of uses. Helium we use in balloons, 
and they are also used in neon lights as you can see here in the amazing city of Osaka. Moving over one group to group seven we have the halogens. We are still in the non-metals and these are going to go around as diatomic molecules which means their formula is going to be for chlorine gas Cl2 Fluorine gas, F2, bromine gas, Br2, they're going to go around together in pairs. Because they only want to gain one electron, a nice easy way for them to do that is sharing an electron with something else that is the same. So fluorine here can easily gain an extra electron by sharing it with another fluorine. They are highly reactive because they only want to gain one electron. And the most reactive ones are going to be at the top. Boiling point is going to change as we move down the group. So things are going to have a low boiling point or a low melting point are going to be at the top. High boiling point or high melting point are going to be at the bottom. When they react, they're going to gain an electron. Meaning they're going to form minus one ions. And gaining an electron is a reduction. They're going to react violently and rapidly with group one metals because group one metals want to lose one electrons. For example, Sodium, which is a soft grey metal, will react very violently, very readily with chlorine, which is a yellow gas, to form sodium chloride, which is a white powder or salt. A more reactive element will displace a less reactive element. So here we have uh, sodium iodide reactive with bromine. Iodine is here below bromine on the periodic table, so bromine is more reactive. So it will displace um, iodine in the compound, forming sodium bromide and iodine. Whereas if you try and react bromine gas with sodium chloride, chlorine is higher than bromine on the periodic table, so it's more reactive. You are going to get no reaction because bromine cannot displace chlorine out of this. These are commonly known as displacement reactions. The halogens are mostly used for sterilising things, for example chlorine, you're commonly going to know that as uh, from, from swimming pools. Halogens want to gain one electron, so the most reactive ones are at the top, that's where there's least shielding between the electron they want to gain and the nucleus. Your alkali metals react very violently with water and this is where you're going to see some flames coming from, some different colours coming from. This is one of the things that we use to make the different colours in fireworks. So the lovely, lovely lilac frame from potassium we can use in fireworks. If you've seen these in school, these are soft grey metals which are easily cuttable. They need to be kept in oil so it doesn't react with oxygen or with the water in the air because it's a very, very violent reaction. When the metal reacts with oxygen, we're going to get a metal oxide, which if you've seen these in school, when it was cut, it was shiny, but it soon started to dull. The dullness is the metal oxide. The metal plus water is going to form a metal hydroxide. This gives it its name, it's alkaline metal, because uh, the metal hydroxide is going to be alkaline. You can see that by the change in indicator, if it's what your teacher did. And you will also notice this is a very exothermic reaction. It released a lot of heat, it also released hydrogen gas. That's what the fizzing was. The reactivity is most reactive at the bottom. And least reactive at the top. Things at the bottom are going to have a low melting point or boiling point and a higher melting point or boiling point at the top. Alkali metals want to lose an electron and the ones at the bottom are most reactive because there is more shielding between the atom that, the electron that they want to use and the positive nucleus in the middle. Transition metals are in the middle. Their properties are that they are hard, 
shiny and are good conductors. These are basically your traditional metals, so any property of traditional metal, you can generally associate it with a transition metal. And um, because of their properties, they can be used in jewellery, in wires, or in saucepans. Um, and because they get all these different colours, they can be used for things like stained glass or for coating statues. Here the Statue of Liberty has a copper coating. Copper, uh, transition metal compounds are generally going to be blue or a bluey green. Iron 2 is light green. Iron 3 is an orangey brown, a rust colour. Iron Cobalt is a really lovely deep rich blue.